All right, welcome to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I'm Jason Green. If you're new, you gotta check out the rest of the interviews on this channel. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we put up brand new interviews, and there's already about 30 something that you can go back and look at. And if you're digging this, you gotta make sure that you subscribe, and you can like, and you can comment, and do all those things that people uh, beg you to do on YouTube. Now today, we're gonna have a really interesting conversation with a guy that I first met here in Las Vegas when he was in the band Guns N' Roses on their residency. They did two here in Las Vegas. And he's a really cool guy. And I normally would read a whole introduction about his credits, but he has so many of them that I would spend more time explaining it than actually getting to the interview. So we are gonna let him do that. Ron Bumblefit Fall, right after this. All right, let's welcome Ron right now. Here he is. Hello! Good to, you. <laughs> Good to see you. Ron, I'm really glad that you have a guitar with you. You're the first person who brought something uh, to, the, to the show and tell. Yep. And, you know, uh, I, wanted that, I wanted to ask you all about that guitar. But before we start, you know, uh, you weren't born Bumblefoot. You have to become Bumblefoot. And so I want you to tell me as a kid, because your guitar playing is just insane, and everyone who knows you knows that. I, I mean, I took lessons. I had the Mel Bay book, and yeah, and I, yeah. I can't. did books one, two, and three. It worked better for you than me. So now here's a question. Yeah. Because I'm going to keep derailing your train of thought and everything you have planned for this, and go on these random tangents. Here. I like that. Uh, good. The Mel Bay book. Do you remember the songs? Because I found I remember... that you don't forget them. Oh, can I play them now? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, the E string. I... Does, does it ring a bell? Yes. I knew Mary Had a Little Lamb was in that first. And then the two strings, it was in three, four time. I want to see if this like shocks your brain and wakes up all dormant brain cells. That was the advanced brain. lesson. I still I, remember I, I, the Mel Bay book. It's amazing though that you well, you obviously remember it. Uh, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I remember that. I I, I mean, for me, it, you know, and I think for most kids learning to play guitar, it was so unexciting. And uh, I was a teenager in New York, and I got Circus Magazine. And I saw in the back of the magazine, Nick Bocott from Grim Reaper, he wrote the guitar column. I go, I'm going to just track this guy down, and he's going to be my guitar teacher. And that's the truth. Yeah, so there's my... Amazing. How cool, yeah. You, you are, uh, he, and, and Nick's going to be on here next week. But uh, you are a human jukebox, <laughs> which is cool. And a lot of people claim that they can do that, but I've seen you bust out. I mean, most people aren't going, oh, yeah, see you in hell. I got it. I'm ready to go. So, um, yeah, you know a lot of songs. Yeah, yeah. You know, you amass songs over time, and some of them stick. Then, yeah. I don't think people... You know, I think people who know you now think you're this prog rock kind of shredding guy, but I don't think that they would realize that your influences early on were Kiss. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you, you know, I'm sure the same, like New York growing up, the thing that made most of us start playing was, it was like the Beatles made you love music, but Kiss made you want to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like this, this is you, what you wanted to do with your life is you wanted to get on stage and you wanted to do what Kiss was doing. So for me, it was when Kiss Alive came out. And, uh, you know, I had just moved from Brooklyn to Staten Island. And where in New York uh, were you? I was born in the Bronx, but I was living in Washington Heights. Okay, yeah. Very good. Cool. The Bronx. Mm -hmm. So, if I just moved there, and it was this new neighborhood. I was only five years old. And there were all these kids that on my block that were my age. And, they, and we all had the older brothers and sisters that were like two or three years older. And they were the ones that were buying all the rock albums. And I would go and play over my friend's house. And it would just be all these random albums all over the place. And this was the mid-70s. So it was just the greatest stuff. 
and we would just randomly take something. We would just, you know, I would go up to Bob's room and we would sit on his bunk bed and we would put something on the turntable and we would just stare at the speakers and listen for, you know, 15, 18 minutes, flip it. And we do that to all kinds of stuff and discovered so much great music at such an early age. It was in, it was impossible not to love music if you grew up in the 70s because everything there was was great. All the funk, all the, I mean, even now, I wouldn't say it back then, but listening now to all the disco back then was incredible. Yeah. Uh, all the rock music, all the classic rock, this new punk thing that was coming out, uh, all of that. So you're just surrounded, like constantly bombarded with amazing stuff every week, a new, album was out by some legendary band bands that are legendary now and i remember putting on that kiss alive album and when i heard the cheering and and paul doing his thing and, and that mm -hmm. that was it from that age i was just about to turn six years old and that's what made me want to do this and i just copied them and i started doing what they were doing i started i didn't know how to play but I was starting to write songs just based on whatever my child brain could conjure up from whatever limited experiences and, and inspirations there were, whatever I heard on the radio that I could copy the melody of, because I couldn't make my own melodies yet, because I had, had no building blocks yet to work with. Uh, I didn't know how to play. I would lay it on my lap and just play it like a drum. I would go and do that. Actually, I didn't have a pick yet. I didn't know what a pick was. And then someone told me, he's like, no, you're supposed to play a guitar like this. I had borrowed a neighbor's guitar, and, and, and which made no sense to me. You know, having a reach over like this, and, and you can't see the strings. Like, really, it would be better to play it like this. We could you were this. Jeff Healy before mm -hmm. Jeff Healy was, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he had the right idea. So that was it. I started writing songs, started recording, had a tape recorder and the you know cassette recorder in the corner of the room we had our little nylon string guitars me and my neighbor john and we'd be a foot away playing my brother jeff played drums he had a bugs bunny drum set he got at sears and he was 10 feet back and that's how we distance you know for levels and then we had our music recorded then we would press play on that and about two inches away have another one recording and put our faces next to it and sing along and that's how we overdub vocals so we were making demos of our little songs we had and we did shows. And on show day, I would spend the day just taking pieces of paper and cutting them into tiny pieces and filling up those little paper solo bathroom cups and made my own confetti. So all the neighbors that came to the show in our basement or in our backyard or in John's backyard, and at the end, they had the cups and confetti in the air. Amazing. So it was doing everything that I saw, you know, the inspirations doing and just never stopped. You know, the confetti eventually turned into confetti cannons and, you know, got better recording gear. Uh, so, yeah, just stuck with it. That's it. Yeah, and so you had, uh, but you did have guitar teachers over your, your growing up too, right? When I was seven, I wanted to start taking formal lessons and really learn. So I went to a local music store. My mom took me in and I wanted to be a bass player. I originally wanted to be a drummer, but my brother was older and he wanted to be the drummer and he was more coordinated and he thankfully became the drummer because I'm an awful drummer and he's a fantastic drummer. Uh, so that worked out. I wanted to be a bass player because Gene Simmons, mm -hmm. so my favorite character, but I went into the music store and they look at this tiny little kid and they didn't have any kid sized basses and they wanted to make a sale. So they lied to me and they said, well, in order to play bass, you have to play a nylon string, kid size guitar, and take lessons for two years before you can move on to bass. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if that's what I have to do. So I started the Mel Bay books. And I just stuck with it. Eventually I did kind of learn how to play bass, and, but stuck with guitar. And ultimately, it didn't really matter to me. All I cared about was making songs. I wanted to be part of that team, that family, that, that whatever you want to call it, that gang of four dudes that you know on a first name basis and 
they're creating a one of a kind sound together. And that's all I really wanted. And I didn't care what I did as long as I was part of that. So I just wrote songs. I recorded the songs. I played guitar. I played whatever I had to play to make those songs happen. And I just kept doing it. And whatever I learned, I would teach and I would do for other people, which is a very important thing. Because as a musician, you know, we hear music that inspires us so much that makes us want to do the same. And we want to inspire other people. Well, it's the same with learning how to make music and learning how to record and all these things. You learn how to do it, do it for other people and teach it to other people so that they can do it as well. And that we just have a more musical world that we're in. So that's what I always did and yeah. still do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, you know, it shows that you, you can play music because you love to play music. You, you're not in all these different projects because, oh, this is the one that I'm going to be a millionaire or this one's going to go platinum. You love playing music. And and all different styles. And I think that maybe people think, oh, you're a shredder and you're this or that. Because that really is only part of what you can do. Of course, you can play a lot of things. But you, if you listen to your music and different bands you're in, one day it's punk, one day it's prog, one day it's hard rock, one day it's so – you're very versatile in what you do. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I love music and I love all kinds of music. And I think everybody, there's more – than just one side to everybody. And I like to share all those sides. Like, sure, you can pick one lane and stay in it and just focus on that. But I feel like if I did that, I wouldn't be giving people 100% of me. And that's what you want to do as a musician. You want to really give 100% of everything you are. So that includes different aspects of personality and, and vibes and, and this and that. And I love punk music. Sometimes my stuff's going to be a little punky. I love progressive stuff. Sometimes it'll be a little progressive. I love classical. Sometimes there's going to be a hint of that in there. Uh, all kinds of things. And the same with a lot of the bands I play with. I, well, no one's doing this to get rich. If you want to get rich, go do something else. You do this because you love music. And you got to define what or redefine what being rich is and what successful is. Mm. If you get to do what you love, and if you can make a living at it, great. But ultimately, if you get to do what you love in this world, uninhibited, where you can just do it, uh, that's pretty damn rich. Not a lot of people can have that luxury or opportunity or, or just even choice. Yeah. So if you are healthy enough, and if you have put in the work, and you live in a place where you are allowed to grow and flourish and chase after the things that you dream of doing. Uh, as corny as that sounds, you know, chasing your dreams, but it's true. Yeah, that's what we all do. You, that's, that's what we have done and that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, and it's better than having a real job. Um, <laughs> Bo, it is a real job. Well, you know what I mean, though. You like could be real jobs. You could be labeling the soup can at Walmart. That's a, you know, or, or laying asphalt on a 100 degree day, you know, mm -hmm. you playing music, cleaning the windows at the uh, uh, Empire State Builder, you know, yeah. playing music. That's so bad. That's real, real jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm going to move ahead in a minute to, to you know, um, you giving your tape to Varney and beginning your solo career. But before I get to that, what I want to really ask you is so if there's kids out there who want to be Bumble, the next Bumblefoot, <laughs> And people who watch, <laughs> people who watch what you're doing. What is the and, and give me a simple answer though. But what is the best advice that you can give to a player to to, to up their game? Be genuine. Uh, be real. Be truly you and 100% you. And whatever that sounds like, and whoever that is, that's who you got to be. You know, you were put here to be that. And if you're being someone else that isn't you, there's a hole in the universe that you were supposed to fill and, and you're not doing that. Uh, you know, you were born as you for a reason. And the things you love, you love for a reason. And you should be sharing those things and the things that make you so uniquely and individually you, whatever that is. It's not about playing fast or playing this or doing that, whatever, your sound is that is the <laughs> sonic version of your spirit let that out 100 percent and be just you know try to be the best version of yourself of course uh but you have to be the most legitimate authentic version true version of yourself that's what you got to do 
And that's what you should do. And if you don't do that, you will not be happy in life. You're going to feel like a fraud. You're going to never feel right about what you're doing. And you can have all the success in the world, whatever you want to call it, and you'll still blow your brains out because it's all just fake and it means nothing to you. If you want it to mean something, it has to be from a legitimate, authentic place. Yeah. And, I, and there's no magic answer. You got to practice, listen to a lot of music, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, everything. You have to, you got to live it. And, but besides living it, that doesn't mean sacrificing the rest of your life either. Uh, you want to make sure that you can be a good provider for your baby, your music, your career, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it and that you can take care of it. So you need to take care of your health. You need to take care of your mind. You need to take care of your finances. Get a job and do what you gotta do to take care of yourself and to grow as a person so that you can provide for your music. Yeah, well, okay, now, so speaking of careers, let's get into yours and the uh, sort of the humble beginnings of it. You know, back in the day, everybody made a tape. I interview somebody every day and they all have the story of making that tape and sending that tape out. I interviewed Rowan Robertson. He was 17 years old. He went to see Dio play at Donington. Uh, they, were get, they were making a guitar player change. He goes, I'm going to send in a tape. Who is 17 years old? And he gets the gig with, with Dio. So <laughs> it, it, there are crazy stories like this. So you had a tape that you sent to Mike Varney. Mike Varney was known for discovering guitar players. He had Ingve Malmsteen and uh, you know, uh, Paul Gilbert, I think, and um, oh, yeah. Friedman, Jason Becker. All those guys started Shrapnel Records. So you send in your tape. Tell me what the experience is like. So I would make these weird little things for myself. Uh, are we getting this kind of slapback, feedback thing? Or are we good? I don't hear any. Okay, I started hearing it. I think it's gone now. Weird. Okay. All right. So Varney. So I would just for myself, just for my own enjoyment, my own pleasure, I'd make these weird, strange songs. Some are instrumental, some not. And someone just said to me when I was a teenager, I said, oh, you should send that to the Spotlight column in Guitar Player Magazine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, you know, just say, do these for me. So I did. So I sent it to him. I just picked four songs, sent it to him, and he gave me a really, really nice review. And we spoke. And actually, before that, I should also mention, I, there was another magazine, I think it was Guitar for the Practicing Musician. Right. And they had a similar kind of column. And that column was for, you know, unsigned, unknown guitar players, a showcase of, of uh, up and coming or just unsigned or whatever it was. So I sent to that magazine as well. And the guy who wrote for that, he called me. I was like, wow. And I remember he called me. I remember this like yesterday. And he says, you know, every couple of years, a guitar player comes along that's just doing something different, something unique that just sort of changes the way people think about guitar. You're not one of those people. <laughs> wow. You should really learn to play the blues. <sighs> oh, crushing. But I also sent to Varney, who on the other hand, loved it. He said it was one of the best demos he ever received. And he wrote that in, in the thing and said that elements of Zappa and this and that. And we spoke and he talked to me about putting a, a band together uh, with a couple of guys. But at the time, I just wanted to stay on course with my own band and, and keep working that and, and give that a chance. Uh, eventually, years later, we, we always stayed in touch. And I started doing uh, songs for different compilation CDs that, that Shrapnel, he was doing, and his brother Mark had a series called Guitar on the Edge. So I was doing for those as well. There was Shrapnel University. I don't know if it ever came out, but it was like a teaching series. So I did a cassette and transcription book for that. It had to be around 91. And what else? Just a bunch of things like that. And then eventually we talked again about doing, oh, I remember what it was. He wanted to start doing vocal music. And that was my whole thing is that I didn't want to be an instrumental guitar player. I didn't want to do instrumental music. I didn't want to be one of those guys. Uh, and I had a band and I sang and, and that's what I wanted to do. You know, that original vision that I had as a kid, you know, John Paul, George Ringo, Peter Ace Jean Paul. And 
he said, I'm starting another label that is going to be for vocal music. It's going to be for bands. So we did it. So we signed. And after I signed, he said, well, can we just do an instrumental album just to start things off? So I did. <laughs> and that's actually where the whole Bumblefoot thing came from, is in the early 90s, uh, well, yeah, there's the album, The Adventures of Bumblefoot and Other Tales of Woe. So in the early 90s, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, she was in veterinary school studying to become a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And I was helping her study. And one of the diseases, ulcerative pododermatitis, also known as Bumblefoot. And I remember one of the treatments for it was something turkeys get and a way to treat it is you cover their foot in hemorrhoid cream and wrap it in a ball bandage. And the whole thing was so ridiculous. It just made me laugh and, and I said, I'm gonna write a song called Bumblefoot about a superhero that has, you know, it's half foot, half bee. And I wrote this song. And then when I started doing the, the compilation albums, that, uh, that song got on there. And, and when we did this album, The Adventures of Bumblefoot, I said, okay, I got this idea. We're gonna name every song after a different animal disease. And we'll call wow. it The Adventures of Bumblefoot. And it's gonna be sort of like a kind of graphic art, sort of, you know, comic booky looking thing and destruction and all this stuff. And each character down there will represent one of the songs. And then I'm gonna write a song that fits with the name. So there are all these weird diseases that I, I checked out. There was Bumblefoot, there was Orf, Scrapey, Blue Tongue, Q fever, fistulous withers, ick, rinder pest, what, what, a, strangles, what a niche market you found. Some strange stuff, yes. Strawberry well, I, foot rot. I All caution people who Google you to make sure they add Ron Fall. Uh, don't Google just Bumblefoot, you know, now, because you will get some really disgusting pictures. Yeah, all of this stuff, I don't know what's more disgusting, the pictures of me or of the chicken feet with a big fork in the middle. Uh, so this was long before internet searches. In fact, there was barely internet back then. I mean, what, what did you have? Was there Ask Jeeves? And you had to open up, you had to connect your AOL. You know, you had, you had to you know, make the phone call, AOL, welcome. Yeah, this is 1995 at this first debut. Really? Yeah, four. Yeah, the album came out in '95, so '94, putting it all together, and yeah, yeah, the good old days. I remember this cover. I made it using Corel Draw 4.0. Took about two weeks, and mm -hmm. I remember sitting there, staring at my foot, drawing these lines and curving the lines and filling them and making gradient colors little by little until eventually I made that final JPEG, and. It took 14 hours to send it to Mike Varney because I kept losing the connection on AOL. It was only like one and a half megs, the file, and it took 14 hours and like it would go six hours in and then goodbye. Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm staying up all night trying to send this little one and a half megabyte file to him, which at the time was a huge file. So yeah, the good old days. Yeah. Yeah, and so what's uh, so what, what's interesting about this is that this is the beginning of this long uh, solo career that you're going to have. But just on this record, you know, I got some links down below where people can buy your products and check out your music, and that's in the description. But on Amazon right now, this record is nine hundred and six dollars. Somebody's offering one for nine hundred and six dollars, uh, which, but there's. Other people who have it for much more affordable, you also re-released this record under your own label years later, so you don't have to pay the nine hundred and six dollars. Ah, well, what happened was the Orchard, about five years ago, bought the Shrapnel catalog. So I reached out to them. I said, "Look, they're on both of the albums I did with Shrapnel. There's the Adventures of Bumblefoot '95. There was an album which was vocal called Hermit in 1997, and I asked. I said, "Look." Uh, the mastering on the Hermit album, I was never happy with it. I would love to remaster it. And we came up with a whole thing of adding uh, extra songs, you know, bonus tracks to each album and remixing and remastering that Hermit album, which sounds night and day so much better. 
So we did that, and that came out in 2017, like the reissue of these records. So finally they came out 20 years later, more of the way I always wish they would. And they were on vinyl, woo-hoo! So yeah. Vinyl and CD. But after Shrapnel, uh, I learned a lot about what I thought worked, what didn't work, and I started my own record label. And I got distributors all around the world and started putting out my own music. And at that point, I said, okay, I'm gonna call the band Bumblefoot because the music is wacky, it, the name fits. So started making Bumblefoot records through my own label and distributors in France and Germany and Japan and everywhere and, and doing that and started touring and doing everything as Bumblefoot, the band Bumblefoot. And then after a few years being that, I was lead singer, writing the songs, really doing everything and, and not so much by choice. It's just that I ran at a really fast speed and I wanted everybody else to, of course, but you know, a lot of people were part-time doing it and, and weren't just gonna give themselves 100% to it the way I was. So, you know, a lot of it was on me and it became more of like a solo thing than I originally intended it to be. I wanted it to be a band, it's what I always wanted. Uh, but was what it was. So I wasn't gonna slow down. So I just kept doing it and it became like a nickname. So it just became more like Rom Bumblefoot Thal. And here we are. <laughs> now, that guitar that you're playing right there, what, when does that begin? Because, you know, I was, I was doing some research and I was looking into that guitar because when I first saw these guitars, I thought uh, that he's just showing off. You know, here's a guy and uh, here's, a, here's the other one. And I go, this guy is just showing off. He's got a, and then it took me a while to understand. So the top guitar fretless, the bottom one has frets. I'm thinking, is this really something practical? But then I watched you play it. I've heard you explain it, and you can tell other people too. And this is actually more than just the, uh, a, a show-off skill. So t tell us a little bit about these guitars. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to schlep this thing all over the place just for show. I'm more of a actually a minimalist and, and live that way. And, and yeah, this is, for me, it's a necessity. I started playing fretless guitar. Well... I was doing a tour in 97, a solo tour, and I always made my own guitars up to that point. I would just take old guitars and I would just Frankenstein the crap out of them and make all this weird stuff. So the one that I was using mostly was the Swiss cheese guitar, which was an old Ibanez Roadstar from 1983 that I hacked up and did all kinds of crazy stuff to, and that was my main thing. So I was doing a tour in France and a rep from Vigier Guitars. V-I-G-I-E-R, Vigier. I'm glad you pronounced uh, it, not me. <laughs> named after Patrice Vigier, the owner of the company, loved the dude to death, wonderful guy. Uh, and we've been together since 97, happily. So he brought a guitar to, not one of these guitars, like a normal guitar, a normal Vigier guitar, and he said, try this guitar out for your clinic. I'm like, no, no, I play my own thing. I'm not looking for an endorsement or anything. And, and he said, just try it. No, try it, no, try it, no, try it. Okay, so I tried it and it played so much better than my guitars. Uh, my guitars really, you know, I, I endured how they played. Mm -hmm. But Vigier guitars are just, they feel just so good in your hands. So I was like, all right, let's talk. And I remember went out to a restaurant with Patrice and we talked all about everything, got to know each other and great guy. We hit it off really well. And he was willing to make all my weird guitars, my crazy ideas I had for guitars. Uh, I remember one idea I had was a guitar shaped like a three-dimensional map of France with mountain ranges and everything that was hollow and filled with champagne and had a dispenser at the bottom. Mm. And that was a little extreme, and he had a better idea, which was to make a guitar that looked like the cover of that first album, that B foot thing with the wings. So he made that, he made one, and he surprised me where you bend down the vibrato bar and the wings would pop out. Nice. Yeah, it was incredible. And it sounded really good. Like it had this tiny body, but the way it was chambered and everything, it had a really warm mid-rangey tone to it. It was great. So that became my main guitar. And also the first NAMM show I went to with them in 1998, I saw a fretless 
hanging up. And I didn't even know they made those. I experimented making my own years ago and they were awful. And I see this one with this beautiful, smooth, shiny neck. I'm like, why don't you tell me you make these? Mm -hmm. I said, because nobody wants them. Nobody plays them. And I didn't think you'd be interested. Well, I was going to ask I'm very, very before interested. Before you go on with it, is there anyone noteworthy name who plays fretless guitars? Because I've never seen it. Oh, I'm finding a spot to get out of the sun. Oh, the sun is coming. There we go. Good. Um, let's see. Dave Fizinski, uh, Ned Evitt. There, there's a few. There's actually, there's a lot of good players out there. Uh, Are those guys associated with anything I know? Oh, I don't know. Well, there's now there's a guy, Tom Monda, who used to be a student of mine, and he has flourished into this incredible genius of a musician. He has a band called Thank You Scientist. Definitely should check him out. It's wild, wild stuff. Uh, yeah, and he plays one, plays very well. Uh, there's a guy, Chris Bono, who's a great player. Uh, uh, he was in my band for, for one festival we did, and, and great teacher, too. And he plays. Uh, who else? There's, there's a lot of VGA guys. After uh, got one at Guthrie Govan, he used it a, a bit. Uh, so I say more fusion players and people like that did it. As far as playing one on you know, a rock album, like very, uh, like, not just shtick, but really using it. Uh, I, I guess I was the first, I think. Yeah, I don't think there's any, you know, household name type guys, uh, you know, mainstream who play it. So uh, it's, you, it's Matthew Bellamy, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but Matthew Bellamy, his tech hit me up and, and wanted to make him like pretty much one of these, like with a fretless on top and a fretted on bottom. So I sent him all the schematics and, and the, all the tech info for this guitar, and they made one of just, you know, their own kind for, you know, for him. Uh, it's not a Vigier, it's his own made guitar. Yeah. So the dude yeah. who has one now. Who? Uh, from Muse, so he has Oh, okay. One. So now it's sort of like playing, uh, if you're a blues guitar player and you play a slide, it's sort of like that. So you explain it to me and to people who are watching how that fretless works. Well, with a slide, you would put it on your finger and you just touch it to the string so that the string is only vibrating from here to where the slide is. Normally, you'd be pressing the string onto the fret and it vibrates just from there. Like that. But now, like that. With a fretless guitar, it's like having that slide on your fingertips. Your fingertips are the slide. And what's good about that is instead of it being just one straight line across that you're moving, you can pretty much do it with chords. It's great for Zeppelin. I'm always playing Zeppelin on this. Mm -hmm. You could pretty much anything. Yeah. Nice. And it sounds pretty cool having the, the metal neck, you get good sustain. So if you're really driving the amp. Uh, it, you get a lot of cool stuff. You can like grab harmonics and and you could, you could you know you could definitely uh you can get all you know in there on it. And if you want to get a little more. Kind of stuff, so, so there's a lot. So I use this uh, since '98, and the more I would play fretless, and I only had a single neck fretless and a single neck fretted, but I found that I was using this more and more, and it reached a point where in one song I'll be doing a little of both, 
and I would have to choose either playing the whole song just on one or the other. And finally, in 2009, uh, Vijay started making the double neck, where the guitars are pretty identical. You have just a volume knob, no tone, and you have a five-way toggle switch for the two pickups, the bridge pickup, DiMarzio tone zone, neck pickup, DiMarzio chopper, and these are the same on both sides. And then you have the bridge pickup, bridge as a single coil, these two together, these two out of phase to get that really quacky sound, and then just this one. And this is the neck selector, where you can go from here to both to just here. And that's it. And well, then for doing the, the GNR stuff, for doing bucket head solos, I needed the... Uh... So I got the kill switch in there as well. Yeah, this. now that's not completely it, because I want to know about, you've got a thing on there for your thimble. Yes, that too! Thank you, yeah! And this is a totally fascinating thing, so you, you explain it to us. Okay. So, yeah, the thimble, it's something I've been doing a good 30 years. Uh, it's in a magnetized hole that keeps it there. I keep it on my picking hand, smallest finger, and I grab it out of there. And what I do with it is, well, like we were saying before, I'm getting into like teacher mode. We, <laughs> we, are shortening lengths of string by pressing the string against the fret and it only vibrates from that point. And the shorter the string length gets, the faster it's vibrating and the higher the pitch. Now, what happens when we run out of frets? Well, instead of pressing the string against a metal fret, this is my mobile metal fret that I'm pressing against the string. So once we've gone past it, then we go we could get the higher notes there. And then, so what I would do is I would be playing and then I would be throwing this in there to get the highest notes. So, I'm so out of practice being off the road. And getting all the higher notes that way. So that's just... And all that, that weird R2-D2 crap. Uh, yes. But that's not the only way it works. Now, because the pickup picks up in this direction, so you'll get all those higher notes that are in front of the pickup over here when it's the bridge, I mean, when it's the, yeah, the bridge pickup. When it's the neck pickup, these notes are behind it. You don't hear them. But what you can do is you can hold this thimble in front of the bridge so that the string is only vibrating now from your frets to, instead of the bridge, you put that down and you're completely deintonating your neck and you can get, you can play from both directions. Check it out. Let's say you want to go like that. That little distance from here to here that we're shortening the string. take that same distance and if we put the thimble in front of the bridge that same amount it'll shorten the length of string the same amount and it'll raise the pitch the same amount so right there like that so what i do is i play from both directions of the string and what's good about this is that it's like a little mini fretless it actually you know, it doesn't have frets in this direction, so you can slide the notes. Just do all kinds of weird kind of stuff. Uh, so I do that in, in a lot of my, my solos, is if I'm going into something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mel Bay is spinning in his grave right now. Thinking, <laughs> Who knew this guy was going to get a thimble? I needed something. It's, listen, it's, it's innovative, and you, you explain it well, and obviously you use it. This isn't, you, you've shown it's more than gimmick. This is, you, you have your own style and your own sound, and it's because you're trying all these different things. Ron, you have a funny career. You have this career of all different people who are interested in your music and all different types of music. So 
part of the people are watching this and going, I want to know about the fretless guitar. I want to know about his shredding. I want to know about his solo records. I want to know about the thimble. And then there's other people going, when is he going to hurry up and get the Guns N' Roses? So <laughs> it's it's a so we're going to try to accommodate everybody. Um, now, you've taken the high road with all the Guns N' Roses stuff. It has not been your thing to sit on. I was in Guns N' Roses. That is not how you sell yourself. I mean, it's, it's a great thing to have. And you spent eight years in that band, but you have not really wanted to get into uh, mudslinging, not that there's any reason to. And uh, But so I do want to talk a little bit about that band because um, I think it, um, a lot of people discovered you through it, including myself. And you made a really good point to me earlier about that. Uh, so first tell me how Guns N' Roses even came about. Um, they asked Joe Satriani for a recommendation and, and Joe recommended me. So then I got an email and we, and we just started talking. And in 2006, they had a tour ready to go. We met up at SIR in New York and jammed seven times, three songs a night and hit the road for eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and made Chinese Democracy and Appetite for Democracy DVD and a few more that got out there. Yeah. And at that point you were replacing Buckethead. Yeah. And I, you know, I would say, you know, I remember thinking with you and Guns N' Roses, this is kind of a unique character, you know, Bumblefoot and Guns N' Roses, but you're replacing a guy who wore a bucket on his head. So it's, it, it, so first of all, have you ever met Buckethead? Oh yeah, we met at a NAMM show, I think it was in 98 or 99, and then again the next year. And I remember I, either I gave him my Bumblefoot Hands album, it's called Hands, and I gave him that album or he had the album i don't quite remember but when i saw him he told me that he you know, really dug the album and asked if i would sing on some of his stuff so i was gonna sing on his stuff and i called him and didn't get back to me and i tried again and he didn't get back to me and this is you know back then we were all just you know just a bunch of kids that love playing guitar uh none of us were doing super high profile things yet and, and all just just a bunch of guys that just love to play and yeah so that was it so i i stopped calling i figured well you know if he's interested he'll he'll get back to me and, yeah and then found out oh he joined guns there you go so i've never seen him since no right i'd well, love yeah, I mean, he was a, such a sweet guy, such a nice guy when I met him just for the, that brief moment. You know, you get a feeling from somebody. Yeah. And he, yeah, I got a, got a nice feeling from him, yeah. I mean, so you get the feeling that at the time Axl Rose was looking for uh, not maybe a blues rock guitar player solely. I think he was looking to do something different, obviously. And you and Buckethead are something different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it was definitely from a, a different generation of guitar players. Uh, I think we all came from an experimental generation that was kind of post-Shred. Like there was the, the 80 Shred guys, and Shred is not a bad word. It's not, you know, I think some people treat it like it is. No, it's, it's a style of music, you know, usually neoclassical, incredible technique, uh, mind-blowing technique. Uh, so it was sort of the next stage after that. People that, that were doing the shred stuff, but started really getting into some wackier things. And, and also around 1990, when I think that generation of guitar players was coming into their own, uh, there was a lot of music that was cross genre. You know, you had a lot of rock and rap starting to mix and things like that. Like there was the Faith No More. There was the, the like all the, the groups like that that were around that we were all into it was you know right before grunge so all over the world you'll find guys all around that same age and from that same time period that put out music that had really crazy playing but didn't take itself very seriously like it was everybody was cool with letting out their their inner weird side mm -hmm. and just being who they were completely and not trying to be cool, not trying to be weird, just being completely open and being all the above. This is who I am entirely. You know, this is the nerd side of me. This is the this side of me. This is the everything side of me. Just putting it all out there fearlessly. 
And that's kind of what we all were doing at that time. Like my own albums, every single album was <laughs> different. And some of them were pretty strange. Like there was the Uncool album, which all the vocals pretty much were, some of it was kind of rappy, but most of it was crooning like Tom Jones. So picture all this hard rock metal stuff with Tom Jones singing. So that was the Uncool album. And it blew up also in France. They loved it. And they dubbed it this new style of music called crooncore. And it was like doing great. And, and yeah, so the uncool stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically we were saying that the uncool stuff might have been kind of cool and maybe Axel kind of was looking to change it up a little bit. And so you um, in. Well, but here's the interesting thing with that is that if I remember correctly, and, and from what I was told, uh, hopefully I was told co correctly, that remember when that guy told me on the phone, you're not one of those guys, you should learn to play the blues. So I used that as inspiration. And years later when I had my deal on Shrapnel, I wrote a song called I Can't Play the Blues. And it was this whacked out, crazy, shreddy song, uh, not even shreddy, but just like really just doing everything I do with the thimble and all that stuff. And the words were rapping about just making fun of guitar players, how we're always trying to make our amp louder than the next guy and, and all this stuff. And, and it was just making light of guitar players, just making fun of ourselves. And I remember the, it was to like a 12 bar blues kind of music. It was like, like the groove was like, come on. Four bars, then, and then back. So it was doing that thing, but over it, it was doing this harmony of this 28 note run that was like, it was a. In harmony, going through this whole thing, and then the words would kick in, and. and uh, you know, and the solo was just using like every, yeah, the chorus was, I'm full of tricks and trinkets that I always use. I ain't got much choice. I can't play the blues. And, you know, the solo started like doing all that crazy stuff, like this overhand harmonic with this thumping and pulling off with, with that. And, like, all, just like all over the place. And from what I was told, it was that is the song that he heard that made him want to consider me for the band. Mm. Uh, so, so isn't it funny how things turn around? Like you, you have this guy that burst the bubble of a teenage kid and instead of bursting it, I used it later when I did move forward and, and got a record deal and I wrote a song. And then that song, if that's what led to you know, being a consideration for guns, it's really funny how things play out. But it also goes to show a good lesson that if someone tries to knock you down, use it as inspiration because you never know what's going to happen as a result of that. Yeah, it, it, what, a, what a great story. And I, I, first time I've ever heard you tell it, so that's very cool. Um, this, uh, this is the record here, Chinese Democracy, that you did play on. Uh, I, heard, I heard you say an interesting thing. You were talking about this record saying people will remember it later, better than when it came out. Everyone was waiting for the next appetite. This wasn't that record. And I believe that you were right because Axel's playing these songs. He's almost playing the whole record some nights when, when he's pouring. And the songs are now being accepted by those fans and Slash is playing them. And so I think your attitude was right. If you separate this from Guns N' Roses, this is still a good record. Yeah, at the time, people had a lot of uh, things they were attaching to the album. You know, the stories about how expensive it was or how long it took or just the way over time technology and styles and personnel changed so much. Uh, so people weren't listening with a blank slate. You know, they weren't, you know, they already had so many things uh, weighing their, their judgment of what they were hearing. And all that stuff just needed to fade and pass so that people can just listen to it 
and appreciate the great songwriting, the incredible layering and orchestrating of parts in there. Yeah. So, I mean, even now, look, people are going to like any album. They're going to like it or they're not going to like it or whatever it is. But I do believe that over time, it's the kind of album that people were appreciate. They're going to appreciate it more and more, in my opinion. And it's happening. Yeah. Is there a song on this record that you like playing the most? I used to love playing Shackler's Revenge because oh, I, I put a lot into that song uh, as far as just parts that I came up with and recorded and, and yeah. So you know, all the solos and, and singing back and vocals, I didn't sing on the album, but live I would. Yeah. And I would sing while I'm playing. So I'd be doing like the tapping thing at the end. You know? What is that? singing with it. So. I don't believe there's a reason I don't believe it. I don't believe it. What is it? I'm out of practice, sorry. The reason I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So there was you know, a lot that I got to do in that song, so I felt like, uh, you know, it just felt good to be able to contribute more to something. So the more I contributed, the more I just felt good about it. Yeah, yeah. and I think that sure. people can hear your style in that song. Uh, you know, uh, when you listen to that record, I think you can tell who played what, and obviously you see it playing it live. Um, one of the yeah, that, <laughs> that, that weird sound starting the solo. So it's hitting harmonics and then dragging them like Tony Franklin did on the bass. Yeah and getting into all that stuff and then switching to the bottom neck. I barely remember um, my memory is going, I'm getting old. Yes. So if there's cover bands who want to play that song, they better go invest in one of those guitars or you're not going to play it accurately. <laughs> but uh, but so um, one of the other things about Guns N' Roses that I want to talk about, and we'll go on to some of the other stuff, is that uh, I, I was saying that maybe people thought that your gimmick, Bumblefoot, was, you know, you, but you were saying that when you talked to Guns N' Roses, you were willing to sort of put that aside. You were up, you, you wanted to know what the rules were, and you weren't trying to push your own thing. So maybe tell me a little bit about that. Cause I don't think, oh. Yeah, I remember toward the beginning, I, I did suggest that maybe I can drop the, the Bumblefoot name and we could even come up with a different nickname that's more fitting for the band. But I was told that that's my thing and, and people were very supportive of it. They were, they, uh, or I should say the, the people on top were supportive of it and they said, no, this is your thing and, and they wanted me to be me. And that's wonderful and I appreciate that, yeah. What did Axel think of that guitar? Oh, the, well, the foot guitar. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would like that. <laughs> uh, I would be doing guitar solos. I'd be taking a solo and in my in-ears, he would be, I'd be trying not to laugh. He would be saying into my in-ears, when are you gonna get a real guitar? And I would be like trying to keep a straight face and, and not screw up and not laugh. And, and, and for people who don't know, Axel would talk to the band throughout the show, right? Well, we would, yeah, there was, we would, uh, you know, we had in-ear monitors and there would be a microphone on stage with a foot switch. It's deactive, you press it down and, and we could talk to each other like, hey, let's do this song next. And then we all grab whichever guitar changes, whatever it is, and so that kind of thing. Yeah. I heard he was very entertaining some nights, like he'd be telling jokes and stuff, is that true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine you're playing this concert. Yeah, imagine you're playing this show and you have Axl Rose in your ear telling you jokes. You know, it's got to be an yeah, odd. There, there, there was a lot of great stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and so that was eight years of your life, but you still did your own thing because Guns N' Roses was always sort of on again, off again. And, and, and so you were still making records. You were still selling products and promoting yourself. And, it, and I think um, one of the good things about Guns N' Roses is they did, you played a song in the in the set so people got to see all the other guys music 
yeah, that was so cool of them. Um, yeah, we toured 2006, we started in April, no, May, May, started rehearsing in April, uh, May 2006 to July of 2007, and was mo more on than off. And in between legs of the tour, I would go into the studio uh, with Karam, the producer, and, and we would uh, record guitar tracks. And then after that, I did an album called Abnormal and an acoustic album, a little EP called Barefoot. And then th those came out in 2008. And then 2009, uh, we were doing auditions and that was after the album came out and working out all the new stuff to include uh, Chinese democracy songs. And uh, then I, we were off for the summer, so I did a quick tour with Lita Ford. So we just ran around uh, Europe and, and the US and that was a blast. That was cool. And then starting end of 2009, we started, uh, you know, Gum started touring again throughout 2000, till the end of 2010, the very end. And as we prepped for 2009, I, I always hated taking guitar solos. Like I like them in a song, it's part of a song, but to stand there and get all the attention, I just feel like, I'd, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I'm, I get pretty shy and I just, I prefer playing songs. So for the first tours, I did all the, you know, standing there by myself and the whole time I'm doing all this stuff and I'm like, and I'm just saying to myself, I feel like such a dick. I'm such, this is so, people hate this shit. This is boring. They're not here for this. You know, telling myself all this stuff that was probably true. And then, you know, I would get all these messages from fans saying, oh, I wish you guys did Don't Cry. I wish you did Don't Cry. So one day I was like, you know what? This is what, what they want. So what I did is just, I stopped all the brrrr, and I just started playing a guitar version. Just spontaneous, just. Oh, I'm so out of tune. What the hell did I do? Let me clean up that sound. So I'm just playing the melody and, and chords. Every night different, just how it ever comes together. So just thinking of how the song goes and just, just spitting it out. And people started singing along. I was like, cool, cool. And that became part of my solo. Like I would noodle a little bit and then I would go into that and the whole audience would sing along. And at that point I was like, ah, all right, this feels like I'm serving some sort of purpose here. Uh, you know, so I'm adding something to the show, which is what I wanted to do. And uh, so that continued through 2007 and, and then it became part of the show. It became part of, you know, it became a song that we did. Nice. So I needed a new solo song though. So I remember uh, throughout 2009, I, I was like, I'm not taking a solo. I'm not doing a solo. Screw it, we should play a different, you know, just play another song instead. I don't want to take a solo. And I, you got to take a solo. I was like, all right. So I was trying to think of what, what can we do? What, what has been done and not done? You know, well, this. <laughs> that is like, nah, every MIT and you know, GIT dude has done that and it's like all right well what about pink panther i was like all right so i remember we just started working it out real quick in like 10 minutes when we told frank's like give me a tss, 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 tss. tommy give me a... Oh, actually tommy boom, boom, boom. and then just worked out a whole version of it and then we had three weeks off while our gear was being shipped to Taiwan and just worked out what I would play mm -hmm. over it and we started doing it. And then the Pink Panther was my thing. Mm -hmm. So, and I still included my solo shows, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, it's a fun one. See, then 2011, we were gonna have, we were off for a year and during that year uh, I produced a lot and I started putting out a song a month where I would 
release a song every month with backing tracks and a guitar transcription and stems so people can make their own mixes of it and so i was doing that and then we started touring again in 2011 through uh yeah and then we had the residency the end of 2012 and that that was a tricky one because i got in a, a car accident that caused a lot of physical trouble uh yeah. In 2011 and I, I didn't think I was gonna be able to tour or even play anymore and that's why I started doing a lot of uh, producing and figured I was just gonna be studio bound and that was the end of it but I managed to to get it back but I mean I couldn't even like I couldn't close my fingers yeah permanent nerve damage and, and the whole thing and but yeah it's amazing that you, you recovered from that you know well shit happens <laughs> and you just gotta gotta bounce back. That's all. You never hear a three-legged dog dog complain, right? Like oh. you never never hear them saying, "Man, you know, what a you know." They're they're happy as hell. So who the hell am I to complain? So so then we continued and did it, and, and then by 2014, it was time to uh, go our own ways. Yeah, and uh, and I don't think it's that big a, a surprise, but you knew that. The, the reunion was happening, you know, right? Yeah, I knew that 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 was in the works, and and I saw pretty clearly that I, I wasn't going to be uh, writing songs right. and being creative and just being a, a side man, and that's not what I saw for myself, and that's not, you know, that's not why I do this, why I did this, why. I ever did this. Uh, being a sideman, there's some amazing sidemen out there that are just super rock stars. Me, I need to be creative. That's where my heart is. I would rather be in the studio than on stage. Yeah. And I would rather be producing bands and helping them make their music the best it can be. And that kind of thing. Well, and so, you spent eight years doing that. And it was a great opportunity, maybe turn some people on um, to you. You got to play these crazy big venues. But like you said, it was time to go back to doing um, what you do. And Guns N' Roses, it was time for them to go back to what the band was built on. And obviously, they do well yeah. with that. Yeah, God bless them. They're kicking ass. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all good. And yeah, during the, the last few years, I also had a, a band that was <clears throat> developing with some old friends of mine that I used to produce when they were teenagers. like. 20, 25 years ago now, uh, that became a band called Art of Anarchy. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to talk about. So good, good segue, cool. because I got a lot of questions about this band. <laughs> yeah. Is if Axl Rose isn't interesting enough, let's bring in Scott Weiland. I have gotten to work with some very amazing people. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not, you know, that I don't mean that as like a, you know, look at me. I mean, I, it's just luck. You know, it's just like, how do things happen? They just happen. And, and it's a blessing that I was able to work with such interesting people. Mm -hmm. Life it's, well lived. This, Rick, there's some controversy in this, and you, maybe you'll clear it up for us. So Scott Weiland sings on a record, but then he later says, he wasn't in the band and that he just sang on some stereo tracks. So tell me what the hell's the deal with us? Well, ah, uh, yeah. So it started off the two brothers in the band, John and Vince, uh, the two blonde haired guys in that picture, uh, sweetest guys in the world and the most honest and, and yeah, they're just, totally legit uh they wanted to make their dream album just them so they came into my studio they had 10 songs that they wrote music for and the idea was to get different singers to sing on each song so they were recording and i was recording them here and and i started laying also some guitar solos and so then it was like the three of us doing it and then we started looking for singers and they reached out to Scott Weiland. I reached out to some people and Scott was the first one to say yes. So he 
sang a song uh, till the dust is gone. And it was fantastic. He did such a great job. He, he, he's the kind of guy that whatever you can imagine for a song, he would come up with something that you never would have thought of that is just like, why didn't I think of that? Like it's such a different approach. He had his own approach and that's, you know, what made him great. Yeah. So, uh, so after he laid that one song, it was his manager and lawyer told the, told John and Vince said, why don't we make this a band? Let's make this a band. It, it came from his camp. They said, we want to make this a band. Uh, you know, he'll do the whole album and we're going to help you get a record deal and support this thing. So the guy's like, sounds good to me. Sure. So now it's the four of us. And, and <laughs> we had a, an agreement, you know, a big rock solid, you know, it says in big letters at the top band member agreement and how, you know, we're equally splitting, uh, you know, things and publishing and this and that, and then all the things that a band agreement has. And he signed it and we all signed it. And then we started looking for bass players and we got the wonderful John Moyer. Yeah. Uh, you joined. So now there it is. We're a band. So John had a, a friend who was a manager and, and suggested that he manage the band. And the manager said, well, let's try and get a record deal. Cause at this point, uh, we were tossed between, uh, you know, do we get a record deal or do we do it ourselves, put it out ourselves? And our manager started actually working towards getting a record deal. And then when it was time to move forward with everything and release it, uh, that's when uh, Scott Weiland said, I'm not in the band. I was like, well, for the past year we were led to believe you were and we have the signed thing we did an album together and and it was you know it was a real shock and then you know we talked on the phone and he and i spoke for a half hour and he was such a nice guy and and uh i liked him i did uh, i wanted things to work out i didn't want there to be problems i wanted to really find a way for it to work out uh he was working on the the blaster album his solo album and uh, we delayed the album for a year, uh, the Art of Anarchy album, so that he would have time to, to do his and to get all his going. And then uh, reached a point where we had to make, you know, we had to move forward one way or another, either renegotiate what, you know, what was in that agreement or see it through one or the other. And you know, it was reaching a boiling point, and then he he did agree to to move forward with it, and we signed a sort of a, a new agreement. And in that agreement, still a band member agreement, it just said things like like uh, like we're not going to sue him, <laughs> and, and and things about just uh, you know he's going to support the album. Uh, we're gonna, you know, make videos and this, and and the royalty is the same. We're still band members. It's still a band member agreement. We're still band members, and none of that changed. Uh, you know, it really wasn't much different. So then we did two videos and photo shoot, and uh, and we were in negotiations with our record label for everything, and then it was time to announce that the band existed. So we were. Uh, all in contact the night before. I was like, this is my Twitter blurb that I'm gonna say. This is, you know, and he said, you know, let's use the other logo instead of this logo for the, you know, on top of the YouTube and let's do two songs instead of four. And, and it was, you know, he seemed like he did care. Like he told me which song that he really hoped would have been the first single and, uh, you know, the bio was approved and everything was good to go. So the next day we announced, I guess it was, was it January, 2015, I think? It was early 2015 and we announced. And that's when to our surprise, a few hours later, he put out a statement saying that, uh, you know, good luck in finding a new singer basically. And 
So I did not want him having trouble. I did not, yeah. So I quickly, I went onto Rolling Stone and tried to diffuse the thing, the situation and just said, oh yeah, he's got a blaster coming out. I have my little brother is watching album coming out. Moyer has new Disturbed album coming out. You know, we're supposed to be putting out lots of music and, and be prolific, we're musicians. And, and everybody is supportive of what everybody is doing. And besides all of that, we did this together. Like just trying to minimize any- Now do you, call him, do you call him at this point and go, what is this all about? Uh, I didn't speak directly to him at that point. Right. Uh, contact stopped. And and the thing is, he you know, kept saying things in the media and he accused uh, John and Vince of scamming him, said it was a scam from the beginning, was one headline. And at that point, it finally, like, our lawyer reached out and said, was this a mistake? Like, were you misquoted? Like, trying to... You know, not accuse, but just ask and give a chance to fix it, and uh, and we didn't get a response, and it, it turned legal, and so now everyone's suing everyone and all that shit, and You're better <laughs> off at home with your thimble at this point. Uh, and then he passed away. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He passed away. So. And I was, you know, even though I've spent barely two days with the guy and, and a phone call and, and, but still just making an album together and everything that transpired, the ups and downs of it all, you know, you feel like the person is still part of your life and it was really, it was devastating. Uh, yeah. So we spoke with the label and we decided to make the album free. And, and my, first, uh, request, like my first suggestion was that we donate all proceeds from that album to uh, drug programs and things that could maybe help someone else yeah. before they get to that point. And, uh, but ultimately the decision was made to make it a, a album for free. It was the final, music that he put out and we we put it out for free yeah and now uh so there's a bunch of questions so there was an ongoing litigation this nothing was resolved obviously when he passed right no then it, it uh then we reached out to his estate and said look we're of course not going to sue you uh we just if anything you know well can we at least just collect his share of royalties because we did give him a big chunk of money as an upfront advance and the guys were out that money plus legal fees and and the name trashed and uh and it took a long time to get that settled and, and it did yeah. And, yeah what's uh what would your theory be what do you think happened do you think somebody got in his ear he changed his mind addiction what what do you think happened only he could answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, obviously you were shocked. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm asking a question. If you could have answered it, you would have answered it then. Uh, it's, it's, it's shocking that somebody is so in and so out. Uh, he does strike me as one of those personalities, though. And when you do have addiction in your life, sometimes you make decisions from day to day that, that change. But so um, it, it's definitely an interesting thing. Now, you guys continue that band and you bring in, and by the way, did you ever think about calling this band Great Scott? <laughs> because then you bring in Scott Stapp from Creed. Yeah. Now, how is he? So now it's, it's the summer of 2015. The album came out. Um, the label, you know, is not supporting it because, you know, there's all this going on and everything. So we're just, do we let it wither on the vine or do we get a new singer? What do we do? And our manager uh, reached out to Scott Stapp. And uh, so we ended up making an album together. We did. Uh, I can't talk about it because things kind of 
Okay, let me try to read between the lines. Is this record available? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. And it was doing great. It was it was climbing the charts on radio. It came out in early 2017. Okay, that's what uh, I thought. Yes. So can what you're talk? Can we talk off the record? No. <laughs> you mean you just talk to me? Yes. Or just can you edit something? No, out? no. We'll talk afterwards because I, I yeah because I then I'll have to I'll be sitting here editing so don't say anything. <laughs> But okay. but in my opinion, though, well, actually, you know what? It's not. It's I mean, it's it's public knowledge. Uh, we're in a legal thing with him now. Okay, so he kind of jumped ship. Possibly, Some, something didn't work out with his obligation to the band, and you guys are in litigation over it. And then that's there's really not much else to say about it. It's, it's something didn't work out. Yes. Okay. So. Um, it, it, you, you, when you were a kid playing the guitar, you never thought I'd have to sit on here and discuss these things and flabbermouth headlines. And, you know, I just want to play my damn guitar, but but I get it. So okay, so uh, but the record is available, and both of these records. It is. Are yeah, both do you like these records. Are um, I do, and yeah. the Madness album. We, you know, yeah, that that at that point. See, the Art of Anarchy didn't start off with the intention of being a band, but on the second album, it was a, it became a band. It, it had become a band during the process. So that was a true band album with everybody's input and, and writing and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now I know why you didn't want to call it Great Scott. I, I get it. But yeah. Well, yeah. check it out. You got, you have... Scott Weiland, Scott Stapp, Jeff Scott Soto. And right, Scot that's right. And a Scotsman. Yeah, you don't, uh, yeah, so some of them worked out. Uh, I, I don't, something, yeah, they all worked out in some I, I, you way know, that something that, that we were able to do for people musically. They, every single one I see as working out. Now, I know you're not going to answer this question. You can't answer it, but But I, I got to tell you, what's running through my mind is, so who's the most difficult? Scott Stapp, Scott Weiland, or Axl Rose? <laughs> Don't answer. But, I'm not answering, but I'll tell you for sure, it wasn't Axl. Yeah, that's... He was a great guy to hang out with, and yeah. That's the funny thing. Is that's what I was thinking, too. So Axl has the worst reputation in, in some places, and uh, you had a good relationship with him. Um... We had some good times hanging. Yeah. I mean, look, as good as you can. I mean, I don't know. This is. Well, I'm no angel. Right. That, that's the thing. You know, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not perfect. It makes me think this is why you want to make more instrumental records. Uh, <laughs> no, but... I want to make more Sons of Apollo albums and, and work with as many people as I can. I love collaborating with people. I do it all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether I'm, I'm doing, you know, guest work with a, a band or producing a band. There's this great band called the Dodies. This I listen to it. They are so cool. Yeah. This isn't, this band is insane. It's, it sounds kind of like a, a White Stripes punk rock kind of thing, but explain to me what the drummer does. The drummer of the Dodies plays the entire kit with just his right arm and plays keyboard bass with his left hand while singing back in vocals and he totally grooves and he's got pocket and he's got feel and he's great yeah it's a two-piece band yeah it and, sounds uh, like a lot more yeah. yeah and we're we're jumping through your career fast there's a lot i mean but you did play you know you're the kind of guy who plays because you like to play when you were here in vegas you would come play with uh sin city centers when you had a night off with with Guns N' Roses, you like to play music. And so you've guessed it on so many records, stuff that people would never know. You, you gotta go look up his uh, his discography. Uh, but I wanna talk about the Sons of Apollo a little bit. This is the second record we're looking at that, that I'm gonna put back up. But uh, what an amazing lineup. So you got Jeff Scott Soto sang with Yngwie Malmsteen. He sang with Journey. This guy's got an incredible voice. You got Billy Sheehan, who's uh, you know one of the most legendary bass players of the modern time. And then you have Derek Sherinian, who's mm -hmm. played with uh, uh, Dream Theater and Mike Portnoy. He's played with Dream Theater. He's played with, with Kiss. Yeah, he he's was the keyboard player for Kiss for ages. Ray Idol. He's done, I mean, so much stuff. You want to talk about someone who has really played with a, a ton of incredible people. He has, yeah. 
Well, and I think that uh, there's a need for keyboard players. You know, a lot of guys don't want to be the keyboard player. They want to be up front. So if you can do it and you're good at it, you're going to work. And he's like the, the Emerson and, and the, the Lord and, and like the big, you know, real B3 brings with him. And uh, that he's just surrounded by this world of keys and angle guitar half stacks and amps. And he runs half the stuff through, through angle amps. So it's so funny because people will see like this wall of amps behind them and they figure it's mine. It's like, no, I'm, I got my helix going direct into front of house. And he took all the angles and, and he's got all his keys going through them. Wow. Yeah, he is, yeah, powerhouse. So this record that, that we're looking at uh, right now, this came out right before the, the whole pandemic craziness, am I right? Yes, yes, it came out January of 2020, yeah. So the plan is to still promote this record, right? That was the plan, yeah. What happened here? Well, we did, we started touring and we toured around the US and, and Canada, and then we hit Europe. And as we hit Europe, COVID hit Europe. Mm -hmm. And we got about four shows in to a 20 show tour. And we had to throw our stuff a, into a storage facility in, in Frankfurt and get home fast. And that's it. So I'm saying with things open, you could resume promotion of this, right? We could, yeah. And we've been rescheduling tours and rescheduling and rescheduling and, and yeah. But it's going to reach a point where it's, you know. I think if you like this type of music and these type of players, this is a super group. You know, this is really a project that you're going to enjoy. I mean, you've got a guy at each position who is amazing at what they do. And, uh, but I, I do have to ask you, so why does Billy Sheen have a two neck bass now? Can you exp we, explain well, it to me? To keep up with what I'm doing, because I wrote the stuff for Sons of Apollo is in two different tunings. And during songs, I'm switching. I have the bottom neck that is in one tuning that need, in order to play them, you need that tuning. And then I have this neck with a low B on it. So, some of the stuff is this tuning. And then it goes to this neck and then starts doing stuff on this one. And, and in order to follow the different tunings, he's stuck playing a, a double neck bass. So he has two tuning. Each neck is tuned differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... You, 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 you guys got a lot going on in that band. Um, but I recommend people check this out. Listen, there's a lot to check out. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, and there's, you know, we're, there's still plenty we could have got to, but let's uh, let's talk about hot sauce. We got to talk about. Yeah, hot. There we go. Let's talk about hot sauce. Yeah, we could talk about Asia. We could talk about theme oh, we got, yeah. TV we'll just, shows. We could be talking so many things. Well, we're but, gonna wrap up with Asia because that that that's interesting too. But first, we got to talk about hot sauce. Hot sauce is never gonna leave you. It's never gonna sue you. Uh, this is what this is what we need to talk about. But so, okay, uh, Ron, I interview people every day. I would say half of them have a hot sauce or a coffee. And, but I know that you're passionate about this. You also were early to this hot sauce game. This isn't something you did just for the hell of it. You didn't just throw your label on it to make a merch item. And so, tell me about the hot sauce. So I was 12 years old and my older cousin, Steve, bet me five bucks. He dared me to eat a hot pepper for five dollars. And at that point, I was trying to save up to buy gear. I was buying like DiMarzio Super Distortion pickups to rewire into my guitars, things like that. So I needed that five bucks. So I ate the pepper and I liked it. So from that point on, I was into hot peppers and I would always eat them. And I started getting hot sauce and people knew I liked them. So happy birthday, birthday gift, some kind of hot sauce. So next thing you know, Half of my refrigerator is just bottles of hot sauce. And I'm just totally into it. And, and just like music, you're into music, it reaches a point where you want to start making music. 
well, you're into hot sauce, it reaches a point where you want to start making hot sauce. You want people to feel the way they're making you feel. Like you get so inspired by music, you want to give that excitement, that lift to other people. Uh, you get such a rush out of hot sauce, you want to give people that rush. And I've thought about that thing you're talking about, how so many people are into hot sauce. Why? Rock musicians, metal musicians, they are playing the most intense music that there is. They're giving people the most intense experience that they can. They love giving people that. Now, the food version of that is hot stuff, spicy stuff. Nothing can be as sour, as sweet, as bitter, as savory, as salty, as something can be spicy to the point that it will leave you panting and just sweating and your nose running and chugging milk for a half hour. Mm -hmm. Nothing will affect you as much as hot stuff can, as capsaicin can. So wanting to give people that same rush that you do with music, it almost makes sense that this is the food version of it. Hot sauce is the heavy metal of music. It is the most intense form of food that will make people scream and run in circles around a room. So tell me about the, so tell me about these sauces that we're looking at. Uh, oh, yes. So from the left, the sauce. This one is an everything, every day, all purpose. Put it on your eggs in the morning. Put it on every kind of food it goes with. It is a mild sauce with Mediterranean herbs in it. It is a two-time first place winner in Zest Fest, which is basically the NAM show for spicy food. Happens in Dallas every year. It won in 2013 when I first rolled these out. And when I re-rolled them out, relaunched them through my own food company in 2020 and won first place. And then you have Bumbalicious, which is a zesty, barbecue-y kind of sauce. Uh, yeah, it has bourbon, cherry, chipotle. Uh, this one also, two-time first place winner at Zest Fest in its category for like crossover condiment style barbecue hot sauces. Mm -hmm. The hottest one, which is one of the hottest sauces in the world. It was dubbed in the top, was it the number three hottest sauce or number four hottest sauce in the world by the people that make the show Hot Ones. Mm -hmm. It is called Bumble Fucked. And this sauce, literally just a pin dot, a pin point of it, a tiny dot of it will light you on fire for a good 10 minutes. Is that a good thing? If you like that kind of rush that you get, that in, you know, because it does, it gives you a serious rush. Tell me what you would put this on. Ah, let's see. The Bumbalicious has worked well on all kinds of meats, uh, stir fry, veggies. Uh, the sauce goes great with, uh, if you want to, uh, the milder version, you know, of something for Thai food for uh, Indian food, for Chinese food, for even Italian food, because those herbs cross over, it goes great on pizza, Mexican food. Uh, but the bumble eft, that one, usually I'll put it on Chinese food, uh, Middle Eastern food, Greek food, Lebanese. All right, you sold me. I'm gonna try this. All I'm right. gonna let you know. I, I, I needed some things to decorate, so I'm gonna get some hot sauce. I think the uh, the middle one, the Bumbalicious, that one sounds the best, to, to, uh, you know, d d interested to me, you know, because it sounds like something you can really just put on everything. Because I like to add a condiment to almost everything I eat. I feel like everything needs a little enhancement. So um, I'm in. You got me, Ron. I'm going to try this. Out. Good. Let me know how you like it. Let me know what you put it on and how it works. Yeah. I'm always curious to see what people pair it up with. I'm going to make up some new uh, recipes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. all right. Now, we can't forget Asia. So I had no idea you were, first of all, I didn't even know you were a, a lead singer. But now I look at, uh, you know, again, people who might have discovered you through Guns N' Roses or just know you as the shredding guitar player who did the theme for the, that metal show and all these things. Maybe they don't know that now you're singing in the heat of the moment and uh, 
You're on, you were just on tour uh, a couple years back. Uh, yeah, 2019, we toured yeah. opening for, we would direct support for Yes. Yeah, which is huge. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've been singing my whole life. That's the whole thing, because it's always been about songs. And I would write a song and I would sing the song and I would play the song and all my albums I'm singing. So I've always been a lead singer. And with Asia, they hit me up. Well, it starts off, there was this band in 2016 uh, that the tour manager of Asia put together called Platinum Rock All Stars. Mm -hmm. It's Carmine on drums and you had Rudy on bass, uh, Jeff Downs on keyboards, who's from Yes and Asia, and Phil Narrow, who sings with Talis, he was a lead singer. I was on guitar. And then from The Rascals, Gene Cornish was the other wow. guitar player, like two totally different types of guitar players. And we hit it off so well. Uh, he was my buddy. Loved that guy. And we did just all kinds of music from our, our backgrounds. So we would do Rascal songs, and we would do, uh, you know, Hot Legs from Rod Stewart, because Carmine, and, and we would do White Snake stuff with Rudy and, and all of that. Uh, we, we did Video Killed the Radio Star, which Jeff Downs, because originally in the Buggles, that was his wow. song. So we did all that stuff and we hit it off greatly, had a wonderful time. So then Asia had a tour coming up in 2017, opening for Journey. And they asked if I would play guitar in it. And uh, at that time, I was putting Sons of Apollo together. Art of Anarchy was supposed to be doing a lot of touring. And it just wasn't the time. I didn't want to take that on. So they did the tour and, and their guitar player that they had for years, Sam Colson, phenomenal guitar player. And he did the tour. And uh, that was right before that tour is when John Wetton passed away. Right. So the bass player, Billy Sherwood, he took over and, and got them through the tour and did a great job. And, and he, he's a great guy uh, and super talented. He's bass player in Yes and Asia. And Jeff Downs is the keyboardist in Yes and Asia. Carl Palmer, drummer. Uh, Steve Howe, Yes, Asia. So they had a tour coming up in 2019. And I was asked again. And they said they were opening for Yes. And asked if I would play guitar. And I said, hell yeah. I'm a huge Yes fan. And, and the coast was clear. And so, yeah. So they were going to have a, a singer that was going to be singing lead. And then it turns out the guy couldn't do it. And they just all said, well, why not have Ron sing? He can sing this. So me, after being very adamant about not ever being a replacement person for an iconic member of a band ever again, I said, yes. No pun <laughs> so intended. Now I'm replacing the, you know, the main, you know, John Wetton. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh no. It's like, can I live up to this? Can I do this? So, so I started doing my homework. I had a good half a year to get my shit together and, and make this happen. So the first thing I did is I started finding out all the guitar gear that Steve Howe used on the album for the different songs so that I could replicate it in the Helix and get close to it and have the same kind of effects and all of that and started learning his parts to everything. Uh, so I was getting that down. And then I started watching all the old videos from their very first tour up to recently through all the changes they had uh, of you know, different singers and, and band members and everything to get a feel for how they did things live and, and everything. And then started getting down the vocals. And I really had to change the way I sang because I'm more like a Iron Maiden -y kind of singer. Vibrato, bright, high range kind of stuff. And John Wetton is the opposite. You know, it's breathy, it's smooth, and sometimes no vibrato at all. He just goes for it and nails it and hits it. Uh, so I had to figure out how to 
change my default system when I go to open my mouth and make a noise to do everything differently, to open the nasal passage, to, uh, you know, to do this, to do that, to relax this, to not hit vibrato, to make my tone resemble his more. Because I realized that if you change the tone of the singer and the style of the singer, it's it has as much impact to the song as changing the words or the melody. It really does. Uh, you know, if you're gonna sing a song, let's get some sound, let's see. God, I gotta tune the sing up. But, you know, if you're gonna sing a song the way it is on the album, you know, just straight and a very E kind of tone. But if you go, you know, you're leaving now. You're, it's not gonna work. You know, it has to be. It has to have his tone. You're leaving now. Kind of sound. So I had to practice. I had to figure out how to make myself sing in that direction and do things that will make people reminisce when they hear the songs and not be like, that's not how I remember it. That doesn't feel the same. I wanted people to feel it. And also, uh, you know, there was a lot of tribute to John Wen. This was a, yeah, a that tour was that tour was a tribute uh, dedicated to John Wen, and that was the theme of the tour, yeah. Yeah, and that's how I was presenting it. I was not at all looking to interject myself into the band. I wanted people to close their eyes and feel like they're hearing that album and getting that feeling that they got from those songs, which is why they came to the show. Yeah. So I had to really uh, train myself and retrain and unlearn and relearn different ways to, to sing and then make sure that when uh, I'm staring at thousands of people and we had some big crowds, I think the biggest was almost 8,000 people. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because playing the same arenas that I played with guns like years ago, and I saw like a GNR poster with my signature on it on the wall. It's like it was just so weird. I never thought I would be back playing arenas as a front man now, uh, the same places. Like you never know. Did you go on on time? Oh, we we went on on time, but not only that. They had everything so perfectly timed. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. There were four bands playing. It started off with Carl Palmer doing an ELP tribute, and he would have Arthur Brown, I am the god of hellfire, come out and sing with him because when Carl was a teenager, that was his first gig. Wow. Was, he was in Arthur Brown's band. So now Arthur Brown, they're opening the show. Uh, he's still painting his face, wearing a helmet with fire out of the top, kicking his legs, and, and he was fantastic and the sweetest guy in the world. I love that guy. Uh, in fact, his son was the one that decided, helped me decide. He's like, why don't you just call that hot sauce the sauce? Because I couldn't think of a name for it. It was on that tour. I was like, I'm just stumped. I can't think of a name. Everything sauce, all purpose sauce, something sauce. And he said, just call it the sauce. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. fine. So... So it was Arthur Brown's son that named that that nice. sauce simply the sauce. The son of hellfire. So, yep, son of hellfire. That was first. And then John Lodge from the Moody Blues came and did a set. And then Asia went on and then yes. And they had it timed so perfectly with backline and, and rolling this out, rolling this in about two minutes between bands. And they were on time with every single thing perfectly every night. The incredible teamwork. It's Fantastic. A new, experience, new experience for you. Um, <laughs> anyway, Ron, I said it, not you. So they can't use that as the headline. We went on on time. We, we were going on on time a lot of times. We did. We did. It wasn't always that, yeah. Well, you I'm know, one, the, one of the gun's misconceptions about that, well, since we're talking about the time, was that, oh, they go on at this time, but the advertised ticket time and the time the band was going on was always that way. So, like, even here in Vegas, it, everyone knew guns were, well, the band was told we're going on at midnight. So, even though the opening band went on at eight, people would go, well, they're late. Well, no, they're not late. They don't go on until midnight. It's just the way that it's being uh, advertised. So, not all of those were crazy. But by the smile on your face, some of them might have been. 
I'm not saying a word. I don't blame you. Uh, <laughs> the, hot, the hot sauce got your tongue. Ron, we could talk for, for 100 more hours. Uh, well, let me ask you before we go, is, is the Asia thing going to continue? That's the plan. Just yeah. wish to uh, call a happy birthday yesterday and said, looking forward to seeing each other. And, and yeah, they are the greatest bunch of guys. They are such a wonderful bunch of people to be around. Uh, so that was a fantastic tour. Yeah, it really was. And Tell us your website, Ron. My website, bumblefoot.com. Pretty That's much easy. anything Bumblefoot. Like on social media, any of them, Bumblefoot, and you'll find me. Yeah, there's tons of stuff to look at. Like I said, I'm going to link as many products as I can down in the description. And uh, and then you can buy some of those things, which also helps support the channel. And, you know, everyone can get some cool Bumblefoot music gear. He's got it. He's got it all. So, which is, which is great. You got to, nowadays, you got to be in control of your own thing. Uh, I appreciate you joining me. I hope that we're going to see you soon enough. I hope so. Yeah, it's been a good minute, man. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while since I've seen you, and now we, we don't have a choice to see people. So hopefully that is well, all. At least we have this. Like, if we were going to pick a pandemic to be in, we're lucky that it's this one. Uh, we have this technology. We have such a speedy, you know, vaccines already here mm -hmm. quickly. I mean, we could have been in the Antonine Plague of 536 AD, lasting for 15 years in two years of darkness because... A volcano went off in Iceland. I mean, you want to talk about a shit Easy pandemic to be in? That was the one. Uh, yeah, and no, plenty more. So, well, and smart people are working right now on music, on ideas, because when things open, a lot of people are going to get left in the dust. If you just sat around and got fat and lazy, didn't do anything, and binge watched, well, look, I'm, I mean, we're all <laughs> we all ate a little better, but uh, you know, the idea is that you have something ready to go, and this. This show for me has been amazing. It was a fun little thing to do, but now I've caught up with so many of my friends and I, I'm learning more about people's careers in music than I have before. And I think the people watching it are too. And sometimes the greatest compliment is sometimes someone watches me interview someone who they say maybe they weren't a fan of or they didn't know that much about, but they had some time, they sat around and, and everyone's sort of broadening her the horizons. And so this one, there's a lot that people learn, I'm sure. The way I look at it is, uh, there's that old saying, uh, if you have six hours to chop down a tree, spend four of them sharpening the axe. Uh, this is our opportunity, everybody, to sharpen our axe, to do all the things that we never made time for or had time for, to grow, to better ourselves, to learn new things. And I hope everybody's doing that, and I hope everybody's healthy, and, and I hope we all get to see each other soon. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I'm going to ask you the better questions when we go off the air, but uh, everyone else can use their imaginations. Anyway, again, please uh, subscribe, and we'll hope to have more of these up 